The venerable Mark Twain had this take on raising kids. Uh, Mark Twain said that when you're raising your children, this is how you got to do it. When the kid turns 13, you put him in a barrel and you seal him in there and you feed the child through a knot hole. When the kid turns 16, you plug the knot hole. <laughs> Let's be honest, we get it. If you're a parent, you know that when it comes to raising family and children, there are moments of sheer exasperation. But raising kids is also an incredible privilege, and what a joy, and it can be so rewarding. And this morning, as we tune in again to the Family Channel, we want to talk about family life and raising our kids and leaning into the Lord Jesus to find grace in Him to build His strength into our homes and into our kids' lives. And to do that, we're going to look at a portion of a great Old Testament story that focuses on the life of a wonderful leader and a great woman of God, and that person is Esther. So if you've got a Bible, turn to Esther chapter 4, beginning with verse 10. If you would like to use a church Bible, the ushers are bringing them right now. You'll find this scripture passage on page 491 of the church Bibles. Esther was a great woman and leader of God who's raised up at the Lord for a specific moment, a profound moment in history in terms of the life of of the children of Israel. And even as God raised her up for a specific moment, God in his sovereign wisdom has placed moms and dads, parents, in an incredible place of influence. That's the home for just such a time as this. So this morning as we look to these verses of scripture, my hope and prayer is that God's going to use them to encourage every parent here this morning in the high calling that God has given to you if you're here this morning and you're not a parent, think of someone that you know who is a mom or a dad to kids and pray for them. Ask that God would give them grace and strength for the incredible calling that the Father has granted to them. Well, you found that place in Scripture. Let me set the background to the story then for the verses that we're going to study specifically this morning. Esther was a Jewish orphan girl who was raised by a family member by the name of Mordecai. They were but two of multiplied thousands upon thousands of Jewish people that found themselves deported from their homeland in Israel to the distant land of Persia and that by an invading army. In Persia then, Mordecai managed to garner for himself an arch enemy, a guy by the name of Haman. Now, that was a big, big problem for Mordecai because Haman just happened to be the king's right-hand man. Speaking of the king, his name was Xerxes, and he is known in history as a tyrant and a man given to evil and violent excesses. So that was King Xerxes. Well, one day, the king's queen completely cheesed off the king, so he kicked her out of the palace. The king then turned around and launched an edition of Persian Idol. And everyone went all over the kingdom to try and find that woman who would be the next queen to the king of Persia. Well, wouldn't you know it? Persian Idol managed to discover a beautiful young lady by the name of Esther, who was that orphaned Jewish girl. In time... The king actually took Esther to himself as his queen and brought her into his palace. About this time, the evil guy Haman, he resurfaced. Remember, he really had a hatred in his heart for Mordecai, who was Esther's guardian. Out of his hatred for Mordecai, who was a Jewish man, Haman came up with what he thought was the solution to the problem. This is how I'm going to get back at Mordecai. He managed to get the king to sign off on a piece of legislation that declared the annihilation of every Jewish person in the kingdom of Persia. So to summarize, we have a king who loses it with his queen and kicks her out of the palace. We have a guy, Haman, who is very angry with one Jewish man, Mordecai, so plots to kill every living Jewish person in the kingdom. Clearly, those were two guys who could have used an anger management class. Meanwhile, King Xerxes did not know that his beloved Queen Esther happened herself to be a Jewish lady. So at this point, 
it would seem that the solution to this terrible situation that confronts the Jewish people in the kingdom of Persia is obvious. All Esther had to do was waltz into the king's presence and say, oh, by the way, king, this is a terrible law. You need to undo your piece of legislation because I, too, am a Jewish person. All Esther had to do was go before senior psychopath, pleader case, and, problem, uh, pleader case, and the problem would be solved, right? Except for this one difficulty. In that culture and in that kingdom, no one, including the queen herself, was ever to go uninvited into the presence of the king. And to do so, literally, was to imperil one's life. So if Esther were to do that, chances are she wouldn't live to talk about it. What to do? It was an incredible moment, needless to say, for Queen Esther in the royal court of King Xerxes. What would she do? Would she seize her moment, or would she run away from it? How about us as moms and dads? We've been placed by God in a place of influence. It's our moment. Will we seize it and partner with God to build hope and strength into our families? We say, yes, Lord, I'm in. Well, what words of encouragement then can we draw out of the word of God for moms and for dads in terms of their roles, their powerful and significant roles for God's glory of influence within their own homes? Here's the first word of encouragement that I see now in our verses, and it's this. Parents, moms, dads, rest in the Father's sovereignty. Look down to verse 12 of Esther chapter 4. There's one phrase that I want us to focus on. Verse 12 says, When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. Focus on the phrase in the middle of the 13th verse. Mordecai, Esther's guardian, acknowledges that Esther, you are in the king's house. Think about that. Esther, the orphaned Jewish girl, was in the king's house as his queen. This has got to be one of the greatest rags to riches story in all of history. Here's something else that's kind of unique about the book of Esther. The king is alluded to 190 times in 10 chapters, but guess what? God is not mentioned by name even one time in 10 chapters of Scripture. It's a very unique book in God's Word. But the fact that God is not mentioned by name in these pages of Scripture is not to be equated with God isn't doing anything. Think about it for a second. How did it happen that the king became so upset with his queen that he put her out of the palace? And how did it happen that the Persian idol contest just happened to discover Esther, the orphan Jewish girl? And how did it happen that of all people that the king could have taken to himself as his queen, that he took Esther and that on the front end of an evil man's plot to commit genocide against the Jewish people? What's obvious as we read through the book of Esther is that while God maybe isn't mentioned by name on those pages of Scripture, He is powerfully and wonderfully at work, providentially, sovereignly, behind the scenes, in ways that no one, not Esther, not Mordecai, could ever, ever in their wildest dreams have begun to imagine. My friends, can we as moms and dads always remember this? Even as the God of glory was at work in the days of Esther, by the power of his might, providentially behind the scenes, to take care of his children, the children of Israel, in our immediate, our God is ceaselessly, tirelessly at work behind the scenes to pour his grace and mercy and blessing upon our families and upon the lives of our kids, wherever they are, whatever they might be doing. It's incredibly encouraging. Gracie and I well remember the day following worship service some years ago that we were talking to people in the foyer and we were shaking hands. Our oldest son at the time was three years of age, our Matthew. And all of a sudden some youth kids burst into the foyer of the church. Pastor Myron, Grace, guess what Matthew's doing? Well, guess what Matthew was doing? He was using the church lawn for a urinal. 
And that happened in front of plenty of church folks, of course. And Gracie and I looked at one another, and we were mortified, and we kind of thought to ourselves, wow, we're really getting it done when it comes to this parenting gig. (laughs) Fast forward 20 years. My son's now 23 years of age. And I place my arm around my son, and I don't even know what to say as together we watch a team of doctors and nurses working furiously to try and keep his firstborn alive. There have been so many times in my life as a dad, as a parent, where I've just said, God, I just feel utterly inadequate. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. What's the right thing for me to communicate in this moment? How do I speak some hope into the life of my son? Can anyone identify? Have you ever as a parent felt like you're in a little over your head? Here's the good news. Our God never ever has expected for us to take on that role on our own. In fact, as was the case during the days of Esther, God is powerfully at work in the lives of our families and in our kids to bless them, to protect them, to guide them, to encourage them, to call them to himself. And he's never, ever going to stop doing that. What an incredible promise. What a word of encouragement from our Father in heaven. Doesn't matter again if our kids are close to God or far from him. None of that in any way deters God from doing his work in terms of ministering his power, his peace, his presence into our homes and into the lives of our kids. And God is always doing that. And by no means does this parenting gig rest totally upon me or upon any of us. Amen? God is always working. So rest in the promise of your father's sovereign work in the life of your family and in the lives of your kids. And he's never, ever going to give up. Here's the second truth that we see in these verses of Scripture. And I want to take you back now to verse 10 of chapter 4. We're going to read through to verse 14, and it's this. Moms and dads own your leadership responsibility. This is the flip side of the coin. God is sovereignly, providentially at work. We as parents want to then to submit to God's sovereign, providential work and partner with what God is doing. And notice how in spite of the fact, or in addition to the fact that God was powerfully at work in the lives of the Jewish people in Esther's day, God still had something for the queen to do. Verse 10. Then she, that's Esther, instructed him, a messenger by the name of Hatak, to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that he be put to death. The only exception to this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you've come to royal position for such a time as this. We can only imagine the conversation that went back and forth between Mordecai and Esther. He's telling her, you've got to do something. This is serious. All of our people are imperiled. And Esther sends back to Mordecai, well, it's not quite as easy as you think. I can't just go waltzing into the king's chamber. Because to do so is literally to put my life on the line. And Mordecai communicates back, Esther, you're thinking from a faulty perspective. You're imagining a scenario in which you do nothing and this just all perfectly works out. Esther, if you do nothing, you and your family will perish, as will all of the other Jewish people in the kingdom of Persia. Could it not be, Esther, that God has placed you in the very position that you are in the palace for such a time as this? He's got something to do through your life to spare the Jewish people. To get both sides of the coin... God was at work. Absolutely, God was sovereignly at work to protect and preserve and spare the lives of the children of Israel in Persia. And Esther was going to be a part 
of God's mighty work. Esther was not going to be passive in it. She was going to cooperate with the incredible work that God was going to do to preserve his people. Again, divine sovereignty never mitigates human responsibility. Our human responsibility is to humbly submit to our God and partner with him with the humble, faith-filled confidence that God is always working in ways that we could never begin to imagine. Not only that, but our God in his mercy and grace, when we partner with him, when we own our responsibility, when we step up as Esther was to in her day, when we step up as moms and dads, our God takes our humble efforts and he multiplies them by the power of his glorious grace for incredible good in the lives of our kids and in our homes. So Esther was going to be a part of the plan of God that was already in the works to see the Jewish people delivered. How about us moms and dads? Humbly with gratitude acknowledging that God is at work in our homes, how do we partner with him? To invite his strength and hope and grace into our families and into the lives of our kids. Let me suggest two ways. We own our responsibility to lead in our homes, parents. First of all, when we take seriously our actions. We talked a little bit about this last Sunday. In our own homes before our kids, hey, let's ask God for grace to be the real deal. God, help me as a dad to live my faith 24-7. Grant me your grace and strength that I would just live in spiritual integrity before my kids. God will powerfully use that. Let's be real and approachable in our households. Let's ask God for wisdom in our parenting to be neither too liberal and permissive on the one hand or too conservative and inflexible on the other. God, give me wisdom in parenting my kids. And God, as Stephen Covey said, begin with the end in mind, grant me the grace to think. You know, what is my family life? What would I like it to look like by your grace and for your glory a year from now, five years, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? And what actions, what steps do I take then in the immediate to move in that direction? We want to own before God our responsibility in terms of our actions to live the grace of our Lord Jesus before our kids. Here's another way in which as moms and dads, we can own our leadership responsibility in our own homes. It's not just our actions, it's our attitudes. Attitudes are so powerful. And the truth is that we cannot not communicate. A Cornell University study took a whole bunch of students, a whole bunch of kids, and randomly divided those students into two groups. One group of kids was arbitrarily labeled the ordinary students, the run-of-the-mill kids. The other group, randomly selected students now, was arbitrarily labeled the high achievers. These are the kids that have got the intellectual horsepower. Now be reminded, the kids were randomly divided up. Then the teachers were told, this group over here, they're the high achievers. These are the good students. They're the sharp ones. These guys, not so much. The kids were exactly the same. The only difference was in the mind of the teachers. And guess what that study revealed? Consistently, this group of kids achieved higher than the other in their assignments and in all of their exams, and the only difference was in the mind of the teacher. That's powerful. Attitudes inevitably are conveyed. In our homes, how do we perceive our kids? As a little bit of an irritation right now, as something of an inconvenience, or in our hearts do we own the attitude that says these kids are incredible gifts from God, and they've got huge kingdom potential, and God has granted me the privilege of bringing godly leadership to bear in their lives for such a time as this. As we own the heart of our Father for our kids and thank God for them, just know that those attitudes inevitably and powerfully are communicated to our kids. And our children, our children live up or down to what important people in their lives truly think about them. So as parents, as we determine before God to own the heart of the Lord Jesus for our kids, 
we are literally partnering with God who is sovereignly and providentially always at work in their lives. We are partnering with God to bring wise, godly leadership to bear in their lives in a way that will open them up to seek and to receive the grace and the encouragement of the Lord Jesus Christ. One last truth, and for this we're going to look at verse 15 right through to chapter 5 and verse 3. And let's conclude this morning by talking about this. Uh, We trust in God's sovereign work. We say, Father, I'm going to step up. I want to do my part. Grant me grace. I want to bring godly leadership to bear in my family. And then finally, step out with spiritual authority. Verse 15. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given you. So Esther says, Okay. She will step up and seize her moment. But what does she do first? She goes to battle spiritually. And she sends a message to Mordecai saying, Round up all of our fellow countrymen, and for three days we're going to pray and fast and earnestly seek the face of God. And God heard their prayers and showed up. In answer to the humble petitions of the children of Israel, God's courage filled Esther's heart. And she approached the king, and in answer to the prayers and the petitions of the people of God, the favor of the Lord filled the king's heart towards Esther so that he had ears to hear what she was going to talk to him about. And not only that, as Esther stepped out, having done the spiritual preparation, God showed up and did something God-sized. And all of the Jewish people were delivered And the Israelis and the Jewish people to the present celebrate this deliverance that was brought about through the life of Esther through the Feast of Purim. Here's the deal, moms and dads. Let's contend spiritually for our families. Can we own it in our hearts before God to say that we will battle spiritually for our families? We have an enemy who's come to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants our kids. We get that, but in our Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose from the dead, we are more than conquerors. And so together we pray against the evil one and all of his desires and designs to bring difficulty into the lives of our kids. And we pray instead in faith-filled hope that the power and the presence of the Lord Jesus will be released into their lives and they will know freedom and hope in the mighty name of Christ Jesus. So we pray, we contend, we battle spiritually before the throne of grace on behalf of our families and then we ask God for wisdom even as Esther sought wisdom and watch God show up in a way that's needful for the specific circumstances of the moment, even as is described in this Old Testament scripture. God will show up in your life and in your home and in your parenting, and he will bring to you his word of grace for you to minister to your kids as we earnestly seek him. I'm thinking of a mom and a dad, Jerry and Cheryl, ordinary parents who did just that. God blessed him with three girls. And as parents do, they ask God for wisdom, for building Jesus into the lives of their girls. And about the time that their oldest, Shelly, became a beautiful young lady, they just knew that as their girls were moving into their adolescent years, that as a mom and a dad, they needed somehow before God to strategize very specifically so that their girls would be strong in the Lord Jesus and so that they would walk in sexual purity and bring that one day into their marriage relationship. So what to do? They prayed, they asked God for wisdom, and mom and dad got this God idea. They took some of their gold jewelry, took it to the jeweler, had it all melted down, and the gold was fashioned into a key. 
And that golden key was then placed on a gold chain. So sometime after the fact, dad got his best duds on, and he took his oldest daughter, Shelly, out on a date, got her some flowers. They went out for an elegant dinner. And after the dinner was finished, dad presented the wrapped jewelry box to his daughter. And she opened it, and inside was the chain on which was the golden key. Just before the dessert was served, dad explained to his daughter how much mom and he loved her. And what a gift from God she was to them. And he reminded her of how much her father in heaven loved and valued her. And then he said to her, honey, the gold chain is a reminder to you of your sexual purity. And the key, that's the key to your heart. Wear that necklace around your neck, wear that chain, and any time you might be tempted to compromise, think about that chain and think about that golden key and on the night of your honeymoon, you give that key to your man, you give that key to your husband who will have the key to your heart and that will be the greatest gift you could ever give to him. I think that's pretty cool. There's a mom and a dad who said, Father, we need some specific wisdom. For this moment, for our family, for our girls, what does it look like? And you know what? They called out to God, and he gave it, and he does that for us. So parents, rest in your father's faithful sovereignty. He's at work in our homes, whether our circumstances from our perspective are joyful or incredibly challenging. Don't kid yourself. Embrace in faith. He's working. Then say, God... I am prepared and ready in humble dependence upon you to step up to the plate. I want to be a godly leader in my home. Grant me your grace. And then let's ask God for special wisdom for building into our kids, and he will grant it. We love our kids so much. I'd do anything for my kids, my grandkids. I'd come up swinging if I needed to. Our Father in heaven loves them infinitely more. Let's pray.